knew that Susan B. Anthony had a sense of humor, or that she was an abolitionist before becoming the foremost leader of the women's suffrage movement. She worked with Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and thousands of others to win equal rights for African Americans and for women. Eventually, she concentrated on the winning of the vote for women. Caricatured, criticized, and threatened, Miss Anthony never wavered, even after being arrested, tried, and convicted for voting. She never gave up. Since 2002, Sally Matson has been traveling across the country bringing this entertaining history lesson to audiences who enjoy a taste of the past. Sally's a graduate of Northwestern University and uses her research, writing, and acting skills to bring the feisty activist to life. You should know that she has another program as Margaret Bork White, courageous photographer. But now, here is Susan B. Anthony, the Invincible. Diary. 1861. Today, superintended the plowing of the orchard. The last load of hay is in the barn. All is in capital order. Fitted out a fugitive slave with the help of Harriet Tubman. Oh, you all know Harriet Tubman. She escaped in Maryland and went back 13 times. In all, she thinks she saved 80 people through the Underground Railroad. And as she said, I never lost a passenger. Well, if slaves came up the rivers, they might come up the Hudson River, cross along the Erie Canal to Rochester, and we would send them across Lake Ontario to Canada. We would fit them out with food and money and maps, and sometimes they would hide in the produce, in the wagons on the way to Canada. Well, last week, I spent the entire week in Seneca Falls with Mrs. Stanton's family because a friendly legislator said, if Mrs. Stanton would speak for the bill one more time, the married woman's property bill, maybe it will pass. So I took care of the children and she gave the talk. And don't you know, it passed. Now women can have sole responsibility for their own property. They can sue in court and then can have joint custody of their children. Seven years, seven years it has taken to get to this first step toward women's rights. But oh, the babysitting. Dear Mrs. Stanton, oh, this babydom. What a constant, never ending, all consuming strain. We should never ask anything else of the woman who has to endure it. <laughs> Well, truthfully, I didn't mind. I spent many a day and evening at Mrs. Stanton's household, crafting our speeches as her children ran around. I did not care. In fact, Mrs. Stanton recently wrote to me and said, our speeches may be considered the united product of our two brains. I forge the thunderbolts and you fire them. Well, that is true. I'm speaking almost every single night. But I called 1861 the winter of the mobs. Entire mobs are coming out to greet me now. They do not like women speaking in public. And they do not like what I have to say, not about abolition and not about women's rights. They're jeering and stamping their feet. At one session, they doused the lanterns and left me standing in the dark. But Syracuse was the worst. I was burned in effigy and dragged through the streets. Oh, I should show you, I should read to you what some of the newspaper men have to say about me. My father suggested that I keep all of this in a scrapbook, and that is exactly what I am doing. We received an unfavorable opinion of this Miss Anthony when she performed in our city on a former occasion, but we confess that after listening to her discourse last evening, we were inexpressively disgusted with the impudence and impiety evinced in her lecture. 
That was the Utica Evening Telegraph. Susan is lean, cadaverous, an intellectual, with the proportions of a file and the voice of a hurdy-gurdy. New York world. And then, in appearance, Miss Anthony typifies the old maid, tall, angular, and inclined to be vinegar-visaged. Miss Anthony's style of speaking is rather stiff and cold, the Adrian Michigan Times. But this is my favorite from the Oregon City Enterprise. We could not help thinking what a fine-looking and useful woman she might have been had she got married years ago. We wish she had been more fortunate in her younger days. Well, balderdash. That's nonsense, all of it. Meanwhile, Mrs. Stanton and I had formed the Women's National Loyal League so that all during the Civil War, we put women's rights aside and concentrated on the abolition of slavery. Abraham Lincoln passed the Emancipation Proclamation, but that only freed the slaves in the rebellious states. What about all the slaves who had come north? We knew it would take a federal amendment, and we began working just as we had for women. Elizabeth Blackwell was the first woman doctor helping to recruit nurses with Clara Barton. Women were in hospitals and schools and factories. But at the end of the Civil War, we had a problem. The 13th Amendment freed the slaves. That was wonderful. The 14th Amendment gave them citizenship. But in the second paragraph of that amendment, the word male is used the first and only time in our Constitution. They mentioned the word male, and then we could see where they were going. They were going to give black men the vote with the 15th Amendment, not black women, not white women. We would have to get back on our trail and begin working for women's suffrage. And when we did, we lost the support of many of our abolitionist allies. We were betrayed. So I decided that I would like to vote too. And in the presidential election of 1872, along with my sisters, Hannah, Mary, Guelma, and 12 others, we marched down to the barber shop where they were registering, and then we all went back to vote. I was the only one arrested. That was all right. On the day of the trial, the district attorney suggested that women are incompetent to testify in court. And the judge agreed, so I wasn't able to speak in my own defense. And then the next day, the judge came in with a pre-written statement, ordered the jury to find me guilty and dismiss them. It was a travesty. When he said, does the prisoner have anything to say why sentence should not be pronounced? I said, yes, Your Honor, I have many things to say. For in your ordered verdict of guilty, you have trampled underfoot every vital principle of our government. My natural rights, my civil rights, my political rights are all ignored. Robbed of the fundamental right of citizenship, I am degraded from a citizen to that of a subject. And not only myself individually, but all of my sex are, by your honor's verdict, doomed to political subjection under this so-called Republican. The court cannot listen to a rehearsal of arguments the prisoner's counsel has already consumed three hours in presenting. If it please your honor, I am not arguing the question. I am simply stating the reasons why sentence cannot, in justice, be pronounced against me. Your denial of my citizen's right to vote is a denial of my right of consent as one of the governed, the denial of my right of representation as one of the taxed, the denial of my right to a trial by a jury of my peers, the, the prisoner will sit down. Well, I interrupted Judge Hunt four times. What difference did it make? He had already pronounced me guilty. When he said I had to pay a hundred dollar fine, I told him, I will never pay one dollar of your unjust penalty and I never will. So do you know? They let that go. They did not want to have to deal with me anymore. So we lost. 
But I think it was a great turning point for the women's rights movement. Money began to pour in, and we realized we could not challenge the 14th and 15th Amendments. We had to have our own amendment. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1876, when this country was celebrating its grand centennial from Britain, we asked if we could present our Women's Declaration of Rights in Philadelphia. The men said, no, I'm sorry, our agenda is all set. Well, I was able to get five press passes from my brother's newspaper in Kansas. And when they read the Declaration of Independence in Independence Hall, the five of us marched down that aisle and presented our declaration, and they had to put it into the minutes. Do you see one half of the citizens of this nation, after a century of boasted liberty, are still political slaves. We are utterly sick and tired of being pushed back and insulted. Sick and tired of it. I am tired of having every little stripling of 21, half drunk, half nothing, look me in the face and feel that he is my superior and feel that he knows more than the best women that ever lived. Well, 1900, I am 80 years old. <laughs> they had quite a to-do for me at the Lafayette Opera House in Washington, D.C. Letters and telegrams came in. President McKinley invited me to the White House, but do you know I have been to the White House under five presidents? invited myself a few times, and not one of those gentlemen has done anything to further our cause. 1906, Baltimore, my final speech. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. If any proof were needed of the progress of the cause for which I have worked, it is here today, the presence on the stage of these college women and in the audience of all these college girls who will someday be the nation's greatest strength, tell their own story to the world. They give me the greatest joy and encouragement. There have been others just as true and devoted to the cause. I wish I could name them all, but with such women consecrating their lives, failure is impossible. Well, now, Susan B. Anthony went home to Rochester and died one month later at the age of 86. And despite a raging blizzard, 10,000 people waited in the snow to go into the Presbyterian Church, the only place large enough for her funeral. And for those who do not recall, it was another 14 years, 1920, when women finally won the vote. Thank you.